It was early 2012, and a young new mayor has just been elected to lead Vermont's largest city, Burlington. I am Bill Marler, proud to swear, proud to swear that I will faithfully, and I will faithfully execute the office, execute the office of the of the mayor of the mayor of the city of Burlington. The city of Burlington. He becomes the first Democrat elected mayor since 1981, when Bernie Sanders beat Democrat incumbent Gordon Paquette by a mere 10 votes, ushering in a near three-decade progressive lock on the city's mayorship. Well, my hopes are that we're going to hit the ground running and we're going to, that the people of Burlington are going to immediately uh, understand that there's a, a bit of change and that uh, we're an administration focused on getting things done, being financially responsible and being engaged with the people of Burlington. As he came to power, the young Democrat inherited a leftover project from the previous administration, a project that would later simply come to be known as the mural. We also are here today to dedicate uh, a mural that's been about a year, actually more than that, in the making. We've been working on this project since 2009 as part of the uh, 400, 400th anniversary of Sam the Champ de Champlain arriving in the Champlain Valley. What the new mayor didn't know at the time is that the project would ignite a political firestorm that would include acts of vandalism. Someone defaced some of the people in Burlington's Everyone Loves a Parade mural. Vandalism is never okay. When I was a prosecutor, I prosecuted for that. And charges of racism and white supremacy. A mural representing and reinforcing a racially biased history does not belong in our city center. It would be a firestorm that would engulf the futures of more than one of the city's political leaders. Populism, once unleashed, threatens the basis of liberal democracy itself. Coming up, we'll document the painting's history, explore how a community heals after acts of violence, and with the city's decision to remove the artwork by 2022, the resolution, as after amendments, passes by a vote of 8 to 3. We'll ask, what happens next to the mural? Our story begins in 2009 when a group of merchants sought to beautify a local alleyway. Where the idea came for this, I have no idea. I know the problems it was trying to address. We had an alley that people were uncomfortable walking through for whatever reason. It was dirty, it was crowded with people that seemed a little threatening. Um, we were coming from a dirty parking garage through a dirty alley to get to this beautiful marketplace. And I thought the idea for it was to make it a more welcoming journey from the parking garage to the marketplace. Bob Conlon is the current owner of Lunig's Restaurant on the Church Street Marketplace. When the mural started, I was just a minority stockholder in the restaurant. My landlord, Robert Fuller, was the majority owner and he came, he went to a meeting and said, we're going to support this. One of the challenges going forward is how to keep it fresh. And I've been to other cities and seen murals, Toronto and Quebec and places like that. I thought, wow, what a great concept and a way to keep things fresh. So this project was, uh, was started by Ron and then I sort of bought in early, seeing the potential. And my personal goal is to have 10 or 12 of these high quality murals around town so then Burlington can market itself as a place to come and do the mural walk. It's another reason to come downtown. It's another reason to keep things fresh. Lunigs did pay to be on that mural. And I'm assuming, I'm certainly hoping, that all the businesses represented also paid. But if, even if that's the case, you know, a lot of the businesses are smaller than we are. So maybe they paid less, maybe they're depicted, they have a smaller section of it. Jane Nodell was on the city council when the mural was approved. I think the, the city and the Church Street Marketplace felt that that alleyway that connects the parking garage to Church Street needed attention because there was a lot of activity going on there which was uh, not salutary to public use of the marketplace. So it was really an initiative of the mayor's office with the Church Street Marketplace. That would have been when um, Mayor Kiss 
was in office. It was very much an activity that he engaged in and, and supported. And so Church Street Marketplace set up a process to solicit proposals from artists and they had a huge committee, lots of people, evaluate those proposals and they selected one which is the one that was proposed by Mr. Hardy. We probably had a fairly loose public art policy at the time, which has been strengthened and we're trying to improve it. So I think there were some lessons learned from that. But I think the Church Street Marketplace thought it was within its its domain. And again, it was in conjunction with the Samuel D. Champlain 400th anniversary of arriving on the shores of Lake Champlain. In March of 2012, Burlington voters elected a new mayor to lead their city. He's the first Democrat elected mayor in over 30 years. Well, tonight is the um, changeover for the new mayor, the new mayor being sworn in, and uh, it's a big day. I'm sure he's going to do a great job. And it's great to see this turnout here this evening. It was time for a change, and tonight we're going to have the change. And the mural project moves forward with its unveiling that summer. My name is Pierre Hardy. I am the mind behind ELAP, the mural. I'm here today to pay my respect and to express my gratitude. This project would still be on paper today if it wasn't for the commitment and the dedication of the Church Street Marketplace Foundation team under the direction of Mr. Ron Renman and the most progressive and proactive entrepreneurs of downtown Burlington. This mural is a baby. And like all creations, all births, it involves much pleasure, but also a certain amount of pain. Pierre has not only put paint on the walls, he's also put his sweat, his blood. Pierre is the father of this baby. But all of you in some ways are members of its family and will recognize yourself in its amazing features. On this day, Square Pierre offers it to you for adoption. The initial response, I believe, when they unveiled the mural and they had to think that all the people that were in attendance went, oh, isn't that cute? Isn't it pretty? Oh, I know him. I know her. Oh, that store. I shop there. Or, oh, look, there's, there's my brother. You know, he's on the mural. My initial response was that it felt a bit overly commercial in terms of the type of art. But other than that, you know, I thought it was kind of playful and fun. And there is so much to see in this beautiful parade that you will need a map. And so Pierre has created one. Pierre, wanting to hit more than one target with one stone, has given the task of making this available to you by way of the Chill Out Center, which is the youth center situated in Burlington Town Center. And to help them on their quest to finding peace, they will make a small profit in selling them to you. In honor of my 400th anniversary, they will be available for 400 pennies, four dollars. Pierre Hardy is an amazing guy, you know. I really appreciate him, I like his work. I thought it was very unique in that um, he thought it out very well based on the 400 years of Champlain. Bruce Wilson is executive director of Service Rendered, a local nonprofit organization. Well, Service Rendered, we help individuals with their goals, dreams, aspirations, and we have programs underneath Service Rendered Incorporated. We have uh, we had youth centers in the malls called the Chill Out Center, a free youth centers for kids in three different malls around the state. When I was standing out here talking about his mural, he said, "Wow, did you see those other murals down the alleyway back there?" And I said, "Yeah, those through my program." art so wonderful you know and he said wow you know those are so incredible and I started explaining to him that it was a um, we have a graffiti abatement program that um, give artists opportunities to um, do this uh, community service while cleaning graffiti and then putting up murals and he thought that concept was incredible and so he said Bruce I want to dedicate this map to your organization for the, ch the chill out centers and the work you do in the community and the mural process and all the youth. It probably raised by $3,000. For several years after its unveiling, the mural was enjoyed by residents and visitors to the city alike. That was until October 2017. I first became aware of the mural shortly after when it went up, but like lots of people, just moved on, particularly white people, just moved on and was busy with other things. 
What began my direct involvement with the mural was shortly after the Nazi riot in Charlottesville. That got me thinking about, well, what public monuments occupy public spaces in Burlington that are questionable. And of course, the mural immediately came to mind. Albert Petrarca is a career activist who arrived in Vermont from the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania region. Have been here approximately 10 years, came here for a job, have been retired since 65, and have been an activist for most of my life. We had to go to federal court last week just to get the bare minimum of permits needed to pull this off. So um, the whole thing has been a conscious strategy on the part of the government, from Mayor Ravenstahl all the way up to uh, the West Wing, to try to tamp down the turnout, because the last thing that Obama needs right now is for there to be um, protests from his left, from his base. Tell me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Tell me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. The demonstration was um, orderly, disciplined, peaceful, and we got to the corner of 37th and Butler Street, and the police just decided to unload tear gas. On Indigenous Peoples Day in 2017, at nine o'clock in the morning, I came down here after buying a can of black paint. I came down here and on this placard, which gives some definition to what's on the mural, I spray painted off the wall on this placard. I then walked down to the Burlington Police Department and turned myself in because my motivation was seeing this as an act of civil disobedience to protest the racist nature of the mural. I thought that was very unfortunate that someone was, was kind of operating outside of normal democratic process in expressing their opinion about the murals. And I also think that the mural did not belong to that individual, and it is wrong to deface things that don't belong to you. I was totally taken aback that people had a negative response or saw some kind of hate or white supremacy in the thing. Again, I'm not that woke. I looked at it, I said, it's pictures of the businesses, it's pictures of Champlain, it's pictures of some politicians and it's a much nicer entrance to the marketplace than was there. So I ended up getting charged with unlawful mischief. I did community service and then in the process um, of turning myself in, I also went to the free press and I said, here's what I just did, can I tell you about it? And they took up the story and the next day the mural became an issue in the city. Yeah, well, I do, I do want to say that, um, you know, there's some um, controversy around um, Everyone Loves Parade, um, that mural that Pierre Hardy did. And um, some of it is, I heard, is about people who looks like me are not up there on that wall. And so I have no problem about it. And then here I am, an African-American, had he donated to my youth organization. So I had no problem with the, um, I stand behind Pierre, you know, I stand behind um, the beautiful um, Everyone Loves the Parade mural. <laughs> they should commission him to do more stuff around um, 
or anywhere in the state or anywhere in, in this region. And I looked at that as destroying private property. It's, it's, they, you can call it public art because you can see it from the, the street, but it's on private property. It was paid for with private dollars, and you don't have the right to deface it. You know, you have the right to go to city council and say, this is wrong, we should take it down, but don't deface it. I think my primary concern with the mural begins first with the fact that the mural really is nothing more than an urban billboard that the marketplace used to circumvent laws against billboards, and they used art in history to masquerade their way around a law that says that something like this should not be permitted in Burlington. What he did, I think, is unacceptable to behave. And the fact that our law enforcement officials decided, well, we're not gonna do anything about it. We're gonna talk to him. We're gonna give him community service. I don't know, it's like, make us whole. You've destroyed something that belonged to all of us and you have to pay a price for that. Secondly, is in their clumsy attempt to impose this urban billboard on us, they utilized racism to sell the billboard itself. In some cases, we've seen public protests take the form of damaging other people's property. Um, this is also wrong and I think should be illegal and should be prosecuted. And I'm glad that we have been prosecuting it. Um, because if you let that go, if society says, well, oh, we're gonna let that go because you know it really was pretty bad that there are all these white faces in this mural, then it just says that that's gonna be okay no matter what. There are 94 people on this mural who are called notables. 93 of those 94 people are all white. So, racially, this is nothing more than a white supremacist artwork imposing itself on a city that claims to be inclusive in its view of itself. And for that reason, it is literally nothing more than Burlington's Robert E. Lee statue and we want this mural down now. And so one person he did put up there who looks like me is a guy named Twilight. And he was the first black African-American person who graduated out of college. And fortunately, he graduated out of Middlebury College. He did put him on the wall, and I think that was very appropriate. I think that there was some broad language in the RFP that said we want the mural to include historic features. Well, images of people who have been important to the history of Burlington and who have been important players in like the Church Street Marketplace. The only misconception I can see about the mural is that it's exclusionary or white supremacist. It's a snapshot in time for who was here when the mural was painted and who was willing to pay to be on the mural. Uh, it, I don't think it was put up to express the total cultural history of Burlington. It was just, here's who we are, and we're hoping that you'll enjoy this. The main purpose was, we want to bring people into that space. You know, so it may be that, oh, let me, let me go and look and see if I know anybody on this wall, you know? And let's go and we'll bring our kids and we'll see, see here's, here's Mayor Sanders, you know, and here's, you know, all these other people that, you know, I think that was the idea. Well, my experience here is that when the public first views the mural, they have essentially a kind of pop interpretation of the, of the mural because they recognize so many figures, so many brands, so many people who give um, definition to Burlington. When you look at it from a different perspective, suddenly, the veneer and the feel goodness of viewing the mural tends to wear pretty quickly. And then you start dealing with this question 
of, wait, what does this really represent about Burlington? And do I really want this representing my community? As far as whether this rep represents diversity enough, Burlington is not very diverse. And this is the marketplace. I believe every minority-owned business on the marketplace had the opportunity to participate in this if they wanted to. To me, it's not, it's, it's a non-issue. You know, it's, but again, I'm an old white guy. You know, I probably just don't, I'm not woke enough, I guess, to see where everything is offensive. I look at it for what it is. It's a picture of who's here now and welcome to the city, come on in. And it's not saying welcome to the city unless you are this group, that group, or the other group. It's just welcome, everybody's welcome. Everybody loves a parade, it says. It should matter to the individuals and their genuine feelings about the mural. But uh, there's another level to how we or not accept this mural as a way of defining our city. Those are two different ways in which this is enjoyed and interpreted. One is that kind of initial feel-goodism that comes with seeing fish or seeing Ben and Jerry's or anyone else on this wall. And then there's the institutional racism that suddenly it comes to the surface when you point out to people, excuse me, did you notice as you were walking by that the Abenaki are absent? Did you notice walking by that 93 of the 94 notables on this wall are white people? Did you notice there are no LGBTQ people? Did you notice that there's no environmentalists? Did you notice that there's no differently abled people? Did you notice there's no union labor? So there's a lot of things that people just gloss over upon first inspection, but once you engage them, and that's all we wanted to do, was to start a citywide debate and engage everyone, suddenly the interpretations, the feelings start to change. The mural was put up with good intentions. It was paid for with private money. It was uh, enjoyed by many. And I think that this kind of behavior is gonna prevent anything from like that from happening again in a long time. Well, we have here an example of the entire wait staff of Lunigs being portrayed on this mural but we don't have the first civilian gay couple married in the United States included on this mural. I don't believe anybody was excluded. Like I said, in our section of the mural, we have an African refugee who was working in our kitchen as part of it. I know of at least three lesbians that are in our section. I don't know the sexuality of everybody else in it, nor do I care. But when they started saying it was exclusionary, I thought, well, no, we have at least four people that would be considered marginalized groups in need of protection on our section of the mural. And God knows how many others you don't know. I mean, how can you tell? So what we see here is the intersection of capitalism and homophobia, that it was okay to promote your storefront and your business and brand at the expense of including the first civilian gay couple married here in Vermont. And that's just one of the many examples of how money trumped identity here on this mural. Is it wrong to name the uh community health center, the Miller Health Center, because he paid to have it built, or for the respite house to be the Holly and Bob Miller respite house. The alternative for that, for honoring people who paid for something, is to just tax everybody and let the government decide what gets said, and nobody takes credit. There were private donations that paid for the mural, okay? It wasn't city taxpayers. So it was private donations, and people understood that at the time. 
um, which is usually thought to be a good thing. Anytime you can take an expense off of the backs of the taxpayer, that's kind of usually a good idea. All artists had patrons. We, are, we pay the City Arts to sponsor an art show at the gallery. We're one of the sponsors for the Festival of Fools. We're one of the sponsors for, it used to be called First Night, but now it's got a new name, but we were one of the sponsors for that the first time. All of that is done in an effort to make downtown more attractive for people to come to. And we think art and performance helps. The people who go to art exhibits, the people who go to plays and go to concerts, go to restaurants. What the, the Off the Wall Coalition discovered through the Freedom of Information Act documents was that there were only three people essentially involved in deciding who went in this mural. One was Ron Redman, the executive director of the Church Free Marketplace. The other was Mayor Moreau Weinberger. And the third was the artist Pierre Hardy. They were the ones who decided who stayed in there, that triumvirate. And the um, people of Burlington had no democratic input into who went there. I don't know them personally. They may be the nicest people in the world, but I think they're looking for a reason to be offended. I don't know a lot about the Off the Wall Coalition, um, but I assume that it is a political movement that, you know, whose goal is to get the mural off the wall. Um, and if they are somehow responsible for the vandalism that's occurred, then I think that their, their way of participating in the political process is not helpful. After Petrarca's activism, residents started appearing at city council meetings. This issue is about a mural that proposes to tell the story of our community. Some members of our community were omitted from the story. The mural is racist, classist, sexist, historically inaccurate, and benefiting and elevating business owners above the working class. I see the mural as representative of the racist structure of our society. Let's get real about racism and as a city start to undo it. Abnaki Indian Chief Don Stevens also appeared before the council to assert his nation's independence in the mural matter, not activists speaking without permission on their behalf. I want to go on the record and say that Many people have been speaking on our behalf, and many people have been stating what's best for us, as even you've heard some tonight. We are a sovereign nation. We speak for ourselves. We are not victims. We are survivors and have been survivors for a long time. So if you, city councilors, or the mayor's office want to know our official position, please speak to us directly. The next item is 6.11 which is a resolution um, about the Everyone Loves a Parade mural. This resolution is basically asking for the city attorney to look into the legal ramification in taking the mural down. I would note that there was no significant public outcry from the communities of people of color here tonight asking for the removal of this mural. But I did spend as much time as I could trying to get input from my friends who are people of color and acquaintances and neighbors. And I talked to quite a few people and none of them were in favor of removing the mural. For the most part, they did express dis dissatisfaction with the mural and said that they did not feel included, but they did not see the remedy as uh, removal of the mural. What Chief Stevens put in writing for us was, there is always a reaction and consequences to every action taken, good and bad. Please consider all ramifications in making your decisions. And that was, um, that was a, a sentiment that was expressed to me by many, that if we take this issue and we have kind of a knee-jerk reaction to it, and an extreme reaction, we actually can inflame our race relations. Hands if it, you are in support of the motion to adopt that resolution. Seven votes in favor, five votes opposed, the motion carries. From the public response, the council decided to create a seven member task force. The task force that was created after my initial 
act of civil disobedience was the mayor's result to cover his behind. I am hopeful the council will act tonight uh, uh, so that we can uh, get started um, with this important work. And um, uh, it, it is in no way, from my perspective, an effort to sweep anything under the rug. It is, in fact, the opposite, an effort to um, uh, have a full discussion and reach some kind of uh, broad community acceptance of what is currently a, a difficult issue. What he did was he had a hand-picked arrangement on this mural task force. He knew that he had the majority who were going to agree with his direction. All those in favor of passing the resolution, please raise your hands. And those opposed. That vote is nine to one with two absent. Well, I will make a motion to appoint Patrick ba Brown, Terry Melenkoff, Jen Berger, Thomas Carroll, Gary DeCarolis, Brian Sullivan, and Wei Wei Wang as members of the mural task force and respectfully requests that the administration send an email to selected task force members notifying them of their appointment, thanking them for being willing to serve, include the applications of the appointed members and ask for interest in serving as chair and request city staff to send a thank you email to applicants who were not selected. And I ask for the floor back briefly after a second. Seconded by Councillor Nodell and Councillor Shannon, you have the floor back. Thank you. Uh, I wanna thank my fellow subcommittee members, uh, Councillor Nodell and Councillor Jang. Um, I think we worked very hard to reach consensus on each and every one of these appointments. And we had a really good pool of candidates to choose from. We really could have um, gone with any of these candidates and been served very well. Thank you to all of those who applied and for the time that they spent on their applications and sharing their thoughts with us. And um, many of them also came and presented themselves at, uh, to our committee. So um, I appreciate the interest in serving on the committee. The mural task force included four men, three women, and two persons of color. The task force was not impartial, however, as it included those four and opposed to the mural. In his direction was influenced by the presence at each task force meeting of a lawyer from the law office and the Burlington Center for the Arts, Doreen Kraft, was at every mural task force meeting shepherding the mayor's direction through this task force, which he himself had handpicked. And of course, the thing was totally rigged. Hello, my name is Lisa Lord, and I'm a Burlington resident who would like the mural taken down. I think it should come down. I think it should be replaced, and it should be replaced through a process that um, is a, a model for how we, we do business in circumstances like this in the future. So I'm Bruce Wilson, I'm um, executive director of a nonprofit organization here in Burlington. I would say around 95% of the murals in Burlington are through our program. And the reason why we did that is because we have a graffiti abatement program. Everyone loves the parade. Pierre, who's, who um, appreciate the work that we did with the murals and the graffiti uh, removal programs, decided that the mural that he put up there, that he wanted to dedicate it to our organization. And what he did was, he dedicated that map, you read the back of it, to the Chill Out Centers. We have over 50 awards for that. Just won a Kids Safe Collaborative Award just in April. Maybe our fourth one that we won through them. And so I'm here to support Pierre and the work that he did and the dedication that he did for our youth programs. Everybody who knows me sit, knows I sit on a lot of boards and committees around racial justice. I was appointed for the Attorney General to be on our disparity panels. Uh, I sit on our Burma State Police, fair and partial um, policing as well as community, um, um, in the community, working in the communities. 
And so I just want to say, um, let's keep that mural up there. During this conversation, you've received some feedback from the artist who's in Quebec. So I'm going to take a look at one of the things he put in a letter. He said in part, just an awful feeling, sick to my stomach to have to justify my work based off of race and sexual orientation. And then he goes on to describe several instances of African-American history on the mural already and portrayals of other races and sexual orientations. Mural artist Pierre Hardy sent a letter to the task force outlining his viewpoint on the vandalism. City of Burlington Church Street Marketplace Foundation, private sponsors. For obvious reasons, I have refrained from commenting at large, extensively and publicly. I am a professional and renowned master muralist, now retired after a 30-year-long career with over 100 public work to my portfolio. And now for this very sad situation. One day you probably will conclude that it is not a lap that is or was controversial. What is sad and controversial is that a lap has been used as a platform for raising issues by those who feel oppressed, alienated and silenced in your community. A lap is in fact very well loved every day by hundreds of visitors and citizens of Vermont as well as via thousands of social media exchanges. It is a great ambassador for Vermont and a major attraction for downtown Burlington. ELAP is a destination, an experience to which you are invited to take part in, mentally and physically. In my culture, my old social background and comprehension have never had to deal with race as a key factor for communication, sharing, learning, do's and don'ts everyday activities. Race to me is not an issue. I don't see one skin color before I engage. To racialize ELAP is just plain wrong. Just an awful feeling sick to the stomach to have to justify my work based on race and sexual orientation. It is barbaric, ridicule, and grotesque. Pierre Hardy, he's the artist who created it. He's probably he's living comfortably up in Canada and above the fray here. He got paid for his work and I think he's done. He's not looking to go to the mat over this. I also don't believe he looks at it as like, oh my God, this was my my raison d'etre, my life's oeuvre. It was like, it was a job. He got paid to do, he did it, and uh, I think he's done with it. Thank you, um, President Wright and City Council members for having us here tonight. Uh, since late May of this year, we, a seven-member task force consisting of Burlington community members, including educators, business people, and artists, have been meeting at the behest of the City Council in regards to the Everybody Loves a Parade mural. During this time, our task force, um, was charged by the council to quote, while respecting the principles of public art, property rights, artist rights, and limits on government power, to review and consider a wide range of options that leads to a more inclusive outcome, respects Burlington's and, Berl and Vermont's diverse history, and educates our residents and visitors. The, the option should include considerations of amending the current mural, removing it, and or creating a new or additional work of art that better represents Burlington's diversity and other options not yet discussed. <clears throat> so we sought to gain a better understanding of the history of the mural and its current condition in order to provide grounded recommendations that reflect our charge. This included meeting with various actors in the development of the piece, uh, such as business owners, Ron Redman included, um, and reaching out to the artists involved in the mural, um, looking at other examples of similar cases across the country, and having public forums for the community to pr provide feedback. After weeks of information gathering and despite the differing views of the task force members, we have submitted the report and recommendations that you have in hand. Among the eight actions, the task force recommends that the city remove the Everybody Loves a Parade from Leahy Way. Additionally, we recommend that the mural be removed as soon as possible and certainly within the next four years by August 29th, 2022. During this time, we recommend that the city update the informational placard to reflect the reasons for this ultimate removal and to provide historical information relating to the images depicted on the mural. That the city council update its arts and public places um, guidelines and funding requirements and replace the ELAP mural with a mural that correctly reflects the history of Burlington that is inclusive of the people of color that have helped to grow the city. First, I'd like to thank um, Councilman Ali Jang 
for what has been nothing but bold leadership in a really hostile pro-white uh, Burlington City Council. Um, I didn't know what the proposal was going to be. I just heard it tonight that the deal is that um, the mural task force, which itself is a white concoction of uh, Moreau Weinberger and Ron Redmond, um, is going to recommend that the mural stay up for what? Is it four more years? Something like that? Um, until 2020 so that the, the capitalist investors of the mural get their money's worth. But the people, the communities, the marginalized, the vulnerable have to put up with four more years because you're going to make the people um, uh, suffer the pain, the, the exclusiveness, the, 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 just the violence of, of the racist nature of this mural. No one has made an argument that this, that this mural isn't racist. Is the mural racist? I don't think the mural is racist. I think the mural does not, is ex certainly excludes some mem many members of the community who do not see themselves represented there. But I would not say it is racist. Racism is a it's a behavior. It's an act. It's a it's not a th an object. If someone is to we're looking at that mural, okay, and they say to themselves. This mural proves that only white people have contributed to the success of our community. That's a racist thought. Is it the fault of the mural that that person has that thought? Because the next person comes along and says, this is an interesting mural. There's some people missing, but it's showing some important people. It's showing a story about Samuel de Champlain. But I actually think, in terms of the responsibility of the viewer, what I think is it was some activists who said, we need to find something to kind of organize some anti-racism, you know, kind of movement around. The mural became the vehicle for that activism. How racist can we be? Vermont voted overwhelmingly for the black president. We're not racist. We have different opinions as to what this mural is. Um, and I'll respect your opinion to be offended by it, but I won't respect your right to destroy it or to demonize the people who paid to put it up or call them names. You know, none of us are bigots or white supremacists. We're just people in business that tried to promote our business on the mural and tried to promote all of downtown. And many of the social programs that we have, Burlington City Arts, the Flynn Center, are paid for by support from the businesses here on the marketplace. And if the marketplace fails, then that support disappears. And then the shows are gone, the art shows are gone, the buskers are gone. We need, this is a commercial center. After several meetings, the task force made a series of recommendations. The recommendations were then voted on by the full council. We talk about what's up there now is it's a mistake and it's wrong, and I don't see that. Like, I see it part of our history as well that has to be told. And I just want to be clear that I, I'm not going to come back here uh, in January and, and maybe agree with the findings that this mural should be taken down, okay? That if it's not located in a public place uh, somewhere in our downtown area where people can learn about some of our history that went on here in Burlington, which the current mural speaks to, if, it's not, if that's not in a public place where people can see as well, uh, then I'm not sure that I will be voting you know, to remove this. Clerk shall call the roll, please. Councillor Dean? Yes. Councillor Jang? No. Councillor Hartnett? Yes. Councillor Nodell? Yes. Councillor Mason? Yes. Councillor Paul? Councillor Pine? No. Councillor Roof? Yes. Councillor Shannon? Yes. Councillor Tracy? No. Council President Wright? Yes.
Eight ayes, three nays, one absent. The resolution as after amendments passes by a vote of eight to three. How do we best create policies around the installation of public art is a very important question for us. And I think that we need to keep working on it. You need to have a process that has the confidence of the public. So people need to feel like this is a fair process. And you're using good criteria in, in deciding what is going to be publicly funded. I think you need to set up a process. You need to well define the criteria for how are we going to decide whether to do it, how much to spend, whose money to spend, who gets to decide. Let's have a robust discussion about that. And that's part of what came out of the Mural Task Force report and the council's resolution. I disagree with the decision that was made to keep the mural up until 2022. We're not stopping there. Despite the deliberative process and the council's adoption of the task force recommendations, one individual decided to take matters into their own hands. some of the people in Burlington's Everyone Loves a Parade mural. This doesn't sit well with some who are on the wall. Vandalism is never okay. When I was a prosecutor, I prosecuted for that. From the city's perspective, disagreement, dissatisfaction, um, difference of opinion is healthy and, and part of democracy and, and certainly welcome. Uh, vandalism, taking this decision into one's own hands and uh, uh, trying to enforce that on the whole community is not okay. I thought that was really outrageous. Um, that took place after the council had made a, a decision about how to move forward and how to respond to the community concerns that we had made. So it was essentially some individual deciding or group of individuals deciding that they were going to decide what happened. And City Councilor Ali Zhang, who says the mural isn't inclusive and wants it relocated before the 2022 deadline set by the city, also condemns the vandalism. It is not okay and I condemn this action. Well, where do we draw the line? What behavior is not allowed in public? And if destroying property that doesn't belong to you that was paid for with other people's money for the enjoyment of everybody else is not where that line should be, then where should it be? After an extensive manhunt, police announced arrests. A pair of arrests in the Church Street mural vandalism case. Police arrested Eric Meyer for the vandalism and Margot Higgins as his partner in crime. Both are Burlington residents and Myers is accused of spray painting the wall on October 19th, but that damage was repaired. Police say he returned October 31st, causing up to $10,000 in damages. And Burlington Mayor tells me they plan to up the security in downtown to prevent more vandalism like this from happening. When the vandal's name was announced, the realization came he was associated with the political campaign of a challenger to Mayor Weinberger in the previous election. Eric Mayer, please. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it seems like just yesterday we were all gathered here getting ignored about Burlington Telecom. <laughs> and here we are again. Um, I'm working with the Infinite Cold Pleasure campaign for mayor, which is a movement that believes that uh, returning power to individual citizens um, is awesome. And, and we don't have to come here and, and just uh, talk down a hole while um, y'all take notes on your computers and phones and stuff. As much as I appreciate your role in babysitting our municipal credit rating. Um, I think it's quite evident over the last six months that people are, have just about had enough of the interests of um, rich white dudes being placed above average citizens. It was also realized he was part of a well-known local music group, which had seen meteoric rise in and financial support from the local music scene. I just think the thing about propaganda is you just have to be careful because it it's kind of sneaks in there. The fact that it inspires people to feel good in the moment, um, you know, 
can be good, but it also can be alarming if, if there are some um, scarier messages sneaking in. And that's how institutional racism works, is that you know, it's not necessarily someone yelling at you um, as a white person, it's more someone being friendly and, and perpetuating certain messages. So, you know, there's a lot of happy white faces uh, standing next to me and it's less about what someone might consciously feel when they're walking by and more about the sort of subconscious messages that are, that are sneaking in. Art often provokes really strong reactions from viewers and sometimes it's that their expectations don't meet what the artist is doing. Ellery Fouch is a professor of American Studies at Middlebury College, specializing in art and art controversies of the 19th and 20th centuries. One of the classes I teach is called Viewer Discretion Advised, Art, Museums, and Controversy in the United States. Um, and it circulates around many of these same questions about um, the reception of art, how um, different works of art from the 19th century to the present have stirred controversy or strong public reactions. I don't personally find a ton of artistic value, to be honest. It doesn't cr inspire me to feel feelings like being up close with a, a, a painting. To me, it tells us, you know, a story of certain people, so politicians and business owners and um, people that uh, explored and colonized the land. So, so either you agree with how the story's told or you don't, but it's just more about the history and the story. And for that reason, I think it comes off more like propaganda to people than, uh, than art. I think some people want art to be purely about beauty or elevated feelings or positive emotions. I think it would be a different story here if it were the sort of piece that really inspired deep, passionate feeling. Perhaps people sort of get a little, oh, chuckle, that's nice, look, I know that person, you know, when they walk by. But, um, you know, it, there's, a, there's a, a mural over at Dartmouth that is, you know, just stunning. And, and to be in the room with something like that, even if you disagreed with the political message, you know, you would think twice about editing it. Whereas I don't think anyone really, well, yeah, I didn't think twice. Art often provokes uh, such strong reactions from people because it is a form of human creative expression and communication. And when humans communicate ideas, emotions, feelings, concepts to other people, it can create conflict. It's, to me, it's a expensive giant cartoon. Defining art can be a surprisingly challenging and difficult enterprise. So if we think about art as something that is mediated or altered by human hands, we can think about the earliest tools as a kind of art. Cave paintings are an obvious example, but even the manipulation of pieces of flint into weapons or tools could be considered art. I think, to me, I think it might be better described as craft. I guess the reason I call it more craft or cartoon is that it just sort of depicts people in a, in a photo reel type, type of way. So it might as well be just a photograph or a collage. It almost looks like a collage to me. So the original commission for the mural requested the style be trompe l'oeil, which is French for fool the eye, an illusionistic style of painting. It's life-size, the people, um, it looks very photorealistic. Nobody, nobody knows what art is. There's a lot of opinions about it. And I think it's just up to each person themselves to decide, you know, on a given matter. So to me, I've decided in my head that this is craft, not art. But again, that's, that's a pretty arbitrary distinction. Defining art and categorizing what is and isn't art has plagued theorists and everyday people for many, many years. 
and it's something that I think continu we continue to grapple with. I'm thinking of when Marcel Duchamp in 1917 rotated a urinal <laughs> and signed it and declared it to be a work of art. And that is lauded as an amazing example of conceptual art that opened a whole new field of inquiry and creativity and innovation. And other people say that is not art, that is a piece of plumbing. <laughs> it's just that, you know, I have some strong beliefs about uh, our culture and, and, and about the narratives and about the ideologies. And, and so to me, uh, you know, even if I happen to be wrong about the artistic merit of, of this mural, um, that's a risk, you know, that I'm willing to take. I think some people are very invested in drawing a bright line distinction between art and craft. So in some ways, defining what is and isn't art can be a very subjective enterprise. Fouch notes that vandalism of art has been around as long as art itself. The history of the vandalism of art is very long and goes back to the very beginning of art itself. There's a long history actually of political iconoclasm too. We can think back to the 19 teens and the suffragettes movement um, in the UK. A famous uh, suffragette had been imprisoned and was being force fed and treated very poorly. And Mary Richardson, another advocate for women's rights, uh, entered London's National Gallery and slashed a painting uh, called the Rokeby Venus, a idealized nude painting. And her assertion was that people in the UK cared more about this painted imaginary woman than about the rights of living and breathing women. This is the sort of messaging that we want to be really careful with. And I think we're seeing around the country with the Confederate statues coming down. We're just seeing people adapt um, and, and change with, with the times and really grow on, on what we want in our, in our public square. The viewer's responsibility when viewing art is, first of all, to be open to that piece of art, to have a genuine experience. And everyone has different reactions to a piece of art which is part of what is the artistic process, right? But then also to say that the artist has the right to express themselves. And then if you don't like the art, you can choose not to look at the art. The viewer also has subjectivity and gets to have their own interpretation and reaction, even if their reading of a work is different from how an artist might have intended it. The impact is still valid. I've done a lot of research about the defacement of art or iconoclasm. Some theorists have talked about how it comes down to a breach of communication between the artist and the audience. The kind of social contract between them is not being met as expected in some way. To me, like, that fits in with a huge narrative and a, and a large history um, of a lot of people having to just accept things that aren't okay. I think there can be many different objectives <laughs> in the creation of art, and especially in this particular instance and in most commissions, the artist isn't purely expressing their opinions or their feelings. It isn't about self-expression necessarily, but also what the person commissioning the work has requested and ordered. I viewed the mural as something like this realize it's not on property where everybody sees it. The goal was to have everybody downtown carrying these bags when they shopped, but it was all paid for by all these businesses. And you'll notice a lot of these businesses are gone, but at the time, this was a picture of who we are. When that mural went up, it was a picture of who we are. Here's an older one. Somebody came out with a board game, but it was a marketing thing for downtown, and it would be a big map of downtown. And downtown, there'd be all the businesses represented. And inside, there were all these coupons. I think the mural was pretty much something like this. It was just put up on a wall where everybody can see it and you didn't have to pay. You know, it was, it was there for you. There's, you know, business owners who paid money to be on this mural being led by the founding fathers. To me, that, you know, that says a lot about 
capitalism being at the heart of our nation's story. Um, and, you know, and, and the ideology that comes with that is punitive, it's not helpful. In my art and controversy class, we usually raise a lot of questions, but don't necessarily come up with definitive hardline answers. I am encouraging the students to think of why a particular work was controversial. I think the way I think about stuff like this is that, you know, not necessarily what's okay or, or not okay, um, because there's just so much stuff that's just, that's not okay. To me that, you know, that is incredibly not okay uh, to glorify, you know, people that cause so, so much death and suffering um, when they came here. So I don't expect everyone to jump on board with, with my beliefs about that, but um, to me it's similar to the question, you know, like would you punch a Nazi? It's like I'm not sure if that's okay or not, but I know that speaking out against um, toxic ideology is necessary. Sometimes you have to do things that you're not sure if they're okay or not. I think vandalism is an inappropriate way to express your protest, your activism, your reaction in any way, in fact. It doesn't help people to come together around a problem that requires a solution. Amy Small is a leader in Burlington's Jewish community as rabbi at Ohava Zedek Synagogue. When I first came to town and saw the mural, I thought it was great, like, this is wonderful. It's great art, it's colorful. Look at all the personages that are represented here. It wasn't until I became deeply involved in the community in Burlington and began to hear people talk about it that I started to look at it closely and realize there was a problem of inclusivity. Rabbi Small sees a similarity between vandalism based on acts of protest and acts of hate. The vandalism in town seems to me to have been an act of protest, but the vandalism of our sign was not an act of protest, it was an act of hate. Nevertheless, they come from the same environment where somehow it has become acceptable in the eyes of some in our communities across our country that we can express ourselves through behavior that is socially unacceptable, through vandalism, harming others. A lot of controversies about murals in the past several decades have been people voicing objections about what is represented in the mural. This case is different in that the problem is what or who is not represented, what's absent. Uh, is the mural racist? I say yes kind of as a shorthand because I don't know that people want to hear, you know, so many words. Um, it's racially questionable. Um, it is white supremacist, I would say. Um, that's my belief. Um, and again, that, you know, there's so much fragility. White, white people don't want to talk about this. They don't want to hear it. I mean, white supremacist just means, you know, white people being supreme and, you know, and look, look at it. It's all, it's all white people. It uh, doesn't even try to tell the story of immigrant populations that aren't white. So again, I think it's very subconscious, but I would say that it is a white supremacist mural. Is the mural racist? I, I stretch my mind as far as I can, and I can't see a racist depiction or a racist intent. I was actually really surprised when I first saw the mural that it was created in 2009 to 2012, um, because it shows a very old school representation of the idea of history. <laughs> it's a very conservative, celebratory representation of people in power. And the past several decades in the art world have seen so many conversations about inclusion, diversity, and grappling with the more difficult aspects of America's past that are completely not addressed in the mural. As far as this mural might be seen as trying to explain the history of this place that we're that we live in, um, it's it's so so limited. It just starts so late in history, and there were people living on this exact land a certain way um, before all these uh, white people came. Does that mural reflect the history that we want to accept as a community? Does it convey the values that we? 
the multiplicity of Vermonters or Burlingtonians uphold. This is where the public art policy comes in, right? Where you need a strong process because anyone walking by that mural is going to have to look at the mural. So it's not like, you know, the beautiful Bonnie Acker, you know, paintings that I have in my house and in my office. But when it's public art, then you are kind of, you know, you're putting in a public space. But still, that art has a legitimate being in and of itself that needs to be respected. One artist defacing another artist's work is pretty short-sighted. Um, if you're not going to defend this artist's right to have his expression, you could be the next one in the, in the crosshairs. We're going to take down your paintings. We're going to shut down your music. Your poetry is going to be banned. It's not going to be allowed to be published. It's like, that's, that's a really dangerous place to be. But there's a difference between public art and private art. So a work of public art is something that is in the public domain, the public sphere, public communal space. And as such, a lot of people have argued that the work has different responsibilities. There's a different community that's perceiving the work. It's almost always on view. Someone is passing by it in their daily life. You aren't making a choice to go into a museum and electing to see this work. It's confronting you as you go about your daily life. And as such, many people have, I think, very eloquently argued for a different ethics of public art that are more about community engagement, inclusion, and the like. Public art is somehow displayed and created through a public process. So then once it's in the public realm, then it, it has some kind of a public purpose. Whereas perfectly private art, you know, that kind of exchanges hands in private markets, that's just between two individuals. It's a private commercial transaction. So many people advocate for a community-based process that solicits contributions, discussions, idea sharing from the very beginning of the process so that the people um, whose communities are the site of the work have an active say and feel included so that their voices are heard. Places like the Mural Arts Society of Philadelphia have been really great at establishing these kinds of best practices for community engagement. Public art versus private art, public sphere, private sphere. Public art should reflect the community spirit and should be in the community benefit. Um, and when it's not, it's you know it's right out in the square. So you know it's it's not in someone's home. It's not guarded. So I guess this sort of a double-edged sword. Sometimes it doesn't reflect the best interest of the whole community, and and sometimes people take that into their own hands. And, and that's sort of the the nature of a public discourse is that when people decide the rule that the rules aren't fair, sometimes they break them. And we wonder why it's getting more and more coarse. People are not paying attention to society's norms of how to behave in public. It's sort of like they used to say the reaction to speech you don't like is more speech. Put up a different, you know, anybody is free to put up another mural, raise money, and it's not easy. But if you have an, something you want to express and you can find enough people that support you, just like we talked about before, all artists had patrons. Find some patrons and put it up. Find a wall that somebody will let you use. Find some people that will pay for your time and your materials and put up a mural. And you can express something that I may find totally offensive. So there have been a couple of very high profile cases of controversies about murals in the news recently. In San Francisco, there is a public school with a, mur a mural cycle about the life and history of George Washington created in the 1930s as part of the Federal Art Project. And people have objected to uh, the representation of George Washington with enslaved people. And their critique is that it's demoralizing and dispiriting for students of color to be surrounded by these works that depict um, the suppression of people of color on a daily basis. The artist was doing something very radical for the 1930s in depicting this not whitewashed version of history, but instead 
encouraging people to grapple with the darker aspects of American history and the oppression of enslaved people. And so, yeah, how do we grapple with how the work is perceived today, how it was intended at the time, um, and ways of moving forward. A plan to replace a controversial mural at a San Francisco high school is getting some pushback now. Save it, learn from it, teach from it. The controversial mural is called The Life of Washington, on display at Washington High School since 1936. Over the years, many students have found it offensive. In June, the school board voted unanimously to have it painted over. But these local African-American leaders think that is the wrong approach. We cannot continue to cut out the things that make us uncomfortable or we will never grow. That mural must not come down. Sure, there are those who say this is no different than taking down Civil War statues in the South. They are out to lunch. One complaint about it from African Americans is that it shows slaves simply being subservient, simply sitting there under the white man's rule. But that's the way America was. But he clearly was putting on display so that we would all be for sure instructionally disgusted with America and its slave practices. After complaints in the 1960s, the school board added another mural celebrating America's multi-ethnic heritage. It was painted by artist Dewey Crumpler, who opposes the school board's decision this time. Imagery is difficult, but that's what education is about, helping us to understand that process. All murals exist to teach that they exist to speak about history. And history is full of discomfort. But that's the very thing that human beings need to ensure change. Because what would change be if we only saw the positive aspects of human nature and not the full breadth of it? Arnatoff attempted to give us the clarity of our history as all great works should do. Art has faced censorship in the private art world as well. So my class on art and controversies spends a lot of time thinking about the cases of Robert Maplethorpe's Perfect Moment exhibition in the late 1980s and also uh, Andre Serrano's photograph, Piss Christ. Piss Christ uh, caused a huge stir when legislators brought it to the attention of the public. It was widely acclaimed in the art world and had actually won a prize when it was exhibited at the Southeastern Center for Contemporary Art in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, state of Jesse Helms. Um, and so that is like, it was his agitation and his desire to bring it to the attention of family values, um, people to bring this work that had been very lauded within the art and intellectual sphere, drawing on history of themes of religion and art, depictions of the body, um, those kinds of representations, and instead make it a kind of uh, puppet for discussions about allocation of public funds. Maplethorpe was best known for his homoerotic photographs and explicit sadomasochistic imagery and the political and legal battles around them. For several years after the culture wars debate of the late 80s, early 90s, it was impossible to see the work as art because um, we were preoccupied with its status as evidence. Robert was a very interesting uh, boy because he was quite shy, yet absolutely confident in his abilities and that he would someday achieve a claim. He would achieve fame, but for the public at large, that came in 1989 when North Carolina Senator Jesse Helms took to the Senate floor to decry federal funding for a traveling exhibition of Maplethorpe's work. I don't even acknowledge that it's art. I don't even acknowledge that the fellow who did it was an artist. I think he was a jerk. When the Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. decided not to show the Robert Maplethorpe exhibition and withdrew as a venue, it caused a huge backlash in the arts community and arguably brought much more attention to 
Maplethorpe's work and the exhibition than it would have otherwise. The work went on to be displayed at a different gallery in DC, which experienced record attendance. These unintended consequences of displaying and removing art have museum curators concerned worldwide, says Fouch. I think for many art world people and museum professionals, the backlash against the exhibition of Maplethorpe and Serrano's works made them think very carefully about how they present those works to the public, what the expectations are around public funding, what the role of the art museum or arts commissioning institution is in society, how to prepare audiences for the works they're about to see, what kind of contextualization might be important. The tilted arc Richard Serra example might be slightly more applicable just because it is part of what sparked the artist's rights and provoked people to start having more community conversations before imposing a work of art into a space that different populations of people use and live with every day. Sarah's The Tilted Arc was a public art installation in Manhattan's Foley Plaza from 1981 to 1989. After public outcry, the sculpture was removed and has never been seen publicly since. You were not happy about what had happened at the Federal Square downtown in which they had removed something that you believed belonged there and was a piece of art and the fact that the government did it offended you. I, I think yes. destroyed's a better word. <laughs> Destroy it. <laughs> destroyed the piece of destroy that's what they did they didn't remove it. they destroyed it yes and okay they, they and that, had ne never done thought, that in the history um, of their granting um, artists work before and since then what the government has done is they've changed the contracts they give artists meaning that they can commission a work of art and the next day they can tear it down and I think as a result of that case that's really a crime to me the value of, a, of public art and especially when it's more like public craft as I would define it um, it really needs to be in line with, with where the community is. And even since the mural has gone up, we've, we've experienced so much change on, on various fronts. So like we've really grown a lot and, and our messaging, our public art um, that tells stories needs, needs to reflect that change. It can't be stuck in the past. VARA stands for the Visual Artist Rights Act of 1990, itself controversial. So VARA rights came about as a way of ensuring the moral rights of artists, not the property rights. It's to ensure that the integrity and authority about the work of art stays with the artist, not with the person who owns the property or the work of art. VARA has been an issue for those who commission public sculptures. As absent a waiver, artists can effectively veto decisions to remove their artwork from their benefactor's land. The city attorney, at the request of the city council, produced a memorandum that explained how the Visual Artist Rights Act was relevant to the decisions in front of the council. And it explained that it concluded that the artist definitely had rights under that federal act that the council needed to be aware of. The work of visual art, according to the legal definition, doesn't include any merchandising item or advertising and promotional work. And arguably, a large part of that mural is promotional work for the Church Street Marketplace. It also excludes any work made for hire. And I think that, again, there's a legal definition, too, about whether he was a private contractor or who got to say what was going in the work. The mural itself is a violation of a federal law called VERA, Visual Artist Rights Act. And what it says is that you can't alter, damage, change, cover an artist's work. And that's exactly what happened here. And that's one of the avenues that we're considering pursuing related to the mural. But also part of the issue is about it says, to prevent any destruction of a work of recognized stature. And I'm not sure that this mural is something that would be considered a work of recognized stature and significance and importance. The city attorney concluded that 
the city was committed to keeping the art there for 10 years because of the agreement between the Marketplace Foundation and the artist. So not necessarily VARA, but because of a legal contract that had been entered into. I think you should be cautious in shutting down people's expression because you don't like it, because you could be in the crosshairs next. It's like in order for your opinions to be respected, you owe other people the respect of their opinions. And I guess that's the, the main thing I would say to anybody. Meyer, raised upper middle class in Middlebury, Vermont, attended the exclusive Williams College, home to the Chapin Library, which houses first prints of the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. He claims in the investigation, his rights were violated. The way that the local government and the local police responded to, the, to this incident um, was alarming. Uh, disturbing and I would even say uh, fascist you know I learned a lot about policing and you know I learned that um, American police can lie and they do so they tried to tell my friends that they were gonna get in trouble if I didn't confess and you know they really uh, got creative with the truth you know it's also been a lesson in a lot of the double standards um, around criminal justice uh, in our country Despite the intensive manhunt, once Meyer was formally charged, his case was referred to restorative justice. I definitely believe that there are deep double standards between how white and black people are treated. Um, if a black person had been caught doing this, uh, yeah, I know there would have been different outcomes. So I think towards restorative justice, which I have a lot of respect for, um, for and after having gone through it myself, like that should be the goal, getting getting people into programs like that, um, in, instead of you know spending the absurd amount of money that we do to send uh, black kids to jail. Restorative justice is an ancient way of being in community. Um, restorative justice, that term specifically, is about a relationship-based way of addressing crime, of responding to crime. Rachel Jolly is with Burlington's Community Justice Center and explains what restorative justice is and how RJ works. We use the term restorative justice when actually referring to the criminal justice system and a response to crime. Here at the Community Justice Center, we actually use the term restorative practices when thinking about a more holistic or even a preventative approach to, to harm or to conflict. What are the w things that we can take into account to uh, prevent conflict and then when it happens care about those relationships enough to want to restore them. Our experience at Lunix with restorative justice was probably 20 years ago. We had a new owner and a guy came in on holiday weekends and cash checks. He's somebody I sort of knew, he lived in town and I said okay fine we'll cash your check, we'll cash your check. It turned out he bounced several hundred dollars worth of checks. Years ago they used to prosecute you for bad checks, they don't do that anymore, but they sent him to restorative justice and I went and we had to tell him how we felt and how we were abused and you know the, the, the position we were put in by his behavior. He acknowledged it, he apologized, and then restorative justice set up a place where he could pay them and they would pay me. Restorative justice process in a in one of our programs would be when a crime comes to us from, say, the police department, pre-charge, this is, hasn't gone to the state's attorneys yet for prosecution, but is referred directly to us. The steps in addressing that particular case will be to um, identify a victim or victims if um, there are victims, sometimes there is no identifiable victim. We would call them the impacted party in our context. Mm -hmm. And our victim liaison would reach out to that impacted party to, to explain our process, to see how and if they want to be involved. They have a number of choices in that way. And one of those choices is not being involved in any way. But we want to give that choice to that impacted party to see how the crime has impacted them and how and if they want to be involved. We would also obviously reach out to the responsible party or the offender in criminal justice language and schedule an intake for them to come in 
to talk about the crime itself and what was happening surrounding the crime, what has happened in their lives since then, where they are now, and describe a little bit more about our process so that they know what they're getting into. One of the key things that we would check for is that the responsible party is taking responsibility for the crime. If that is not in place, it's probably not an appropriate referral to the Community Justice Center, and we can kick it back to the state's attorney's office. However, if that person is willing to take responsibility and um, is amenable to the process, then the next step would be meeting in what we call a panel, and that is meeting with three to five community volunteers, plus our victim liaison and the impacted party, and to talk about what happened, what, who was harmed in that crime, um, what obligations does that create, how are we gonna repair that harm? The felonious vandalism of the mural, um, I believe was an action that would warrant a more serious law enforcement response than the restorative justice. And I would have liked to see maybe, a, you know, a, a payment of a fine or, or something that would send a message that we think this is quite serious and maybe a little more of a deterrent effect. I think the way that restorative justice works is that it's, tr it's pragmatic. It's trying to make a difference. So I think in, in the process, people have said, oh, he should be in jail and all all this stuff, you know, people are used to a different, a more punitive type of justice, but that just doesn't work. And it, it's, you can pick your study or you can just use common sense. People are not healthy and happy um, after interactions with our um, justice system. You know, one of the misnomers about restorative justice or alternative justice is that it's soft on crime or that it, it actually is, is uh, maybe a slap on the wrist for the perpetrator and it's not true justice. What we find with alternative justice and with restorative justice is this is actually a deeper form of accountability than the typical criminal justice system often provides. So restorative justice actually offers quite a in-depth and, and deep way of taking accountability and so that responsible party talks about the new way that they are reflecting on that crime and uh, maybe a, a new way of going forward. Restorative justice in my experience was, was so many conversations and difficult conversations. At one point we had to use a, a talking stick or a talking stone just so everyone could keep their uh, keep themselves in check with responding to each other in an appropriate way. There are no quick fixes, but I think what restorative justice focuses on is, is you know, expanding human relationships and understanding, trying to have people see perspectives and, you know, maybe further down the line, you know, not right away, but maybe in a few months or, or even years, you know, uh, the, those conversations and being exposed to people of different backgrounds and and beliefs will be really helpful. The restorative justice has certainly some significant benefits and I, I'm glad that that is, is there. But restorative justice does allow, an, allow a, the people who are harmed by an act to express that harm um, and to have the individual commit the act have to kind of deal with that. And that can also be very difficult and could potentially result in, in some, we hope, reflection, some real self, self-examination and some determination to change and not, not repeat that act. I think restorative justice offers a tremendous opportunities for communities to benefit and to heal in a variety of ways. So I think repair is part key to any restorative process and as well as transformation is a potential. It's not necessarily a, a, mo a goal at the, at the beginning, but it certainly is a possibility for, um, for a community. I don't know how well they work with everything else, but the idea of restorative justice makes a lot of sense. The courts are crowded, the jails are crowded. That's not necessarily the proper response to every quote, criminal act. But if you can stop somebody in the bud, make them understand what they're doing is wrong, have them change their ways without doing this, then great, it's a good idea. Restorative justice, for me, clarified um, a lot of my feelings. It was a good chance to be challenged and exposed. I think it really made me realize um, the sort of the depths of the ideological divide. 
you know, people's minds are not getting changed um, very easily at all. And, you know, and they don't necessarily get changed by um, this sor sort of action. I definitely personally grew um, through restorative justice, maybe not in exactly the ways people would think. I definitely have the same beliefs and feelings as I did before, and I, um, yeah, I haven't had any sort of radical awakenings. It's more just that I don't think the criminal justice system as it stands does anything other than abuse and oppress people, so. The phrase restorative justice is a contemporary term. It certainly resonates with our community because we do believe in justice and we do believe that everybody has to take responsibility for their actions. But in Jewish language, we have a slightly different framing for it, and that is the concept of teshuva, which is repentance. In Judaism, if you have wronged someone, you cannot seek repentance with God. You have to first go to the individual or the group that you have wronged and seek their forgiveness. But that concept of restorative justice that tries to capture that in an American language gives us a broader way to do it together as Americans. The confidential nature of restorative justice can raise issues within a community. One might wonder how that the community can be assured that justice is served when all of our process is confidential. Many of our community members are not aware of what restorative justice is or what the community justice centers do. We don't want our processes to be hidden, but the uh, one of our objectives in terms of being successful in a restorative process is that it feels like a safe space. And so the idea of the particulars of somebody's contract being held confidentially is, is a component of keeping that as a safe space. Community members who are concerned with what we are doing should come and ask us and we are happy to share more. They, should, they can come and, and um, observe a panel and they can also talk to us in general about specific cases. If there is a specific case that has caused harm, perhaps they would be considered an impacted party and they could be involved in a more meaningful way in our process. Despite this confidentiality, Jolly believes strongly that RJ can help a community heal after acts of violence. So when I think about um, an opportunity being given to a community when there's an issue, I do think about what is the accountability on, on all of us as citizens, as community members, or a, and as organizations like the Community Justice Center. This is clearly a, a very complicated topic. Maybe this is an opportunity for the Burlington CJC to hold a community conversation and just invite people to come together to talk and share perspectives Again, with the goal of reaching understanding and maybe even addressing harm before any crime has been committed, that is actually the best opportunity for us to play a role. Community healing has been a topic in, in my restorative justice process for sure. Um, and I, yeah, I care about the community and I think what my beliefs are, are fo actually focused on the community. I think, you know, it just needs to come from a place of like, wh how can we minimize damage and how can we, you know, encourage progress without, um, you know, feeling like there is this utopia that we just need to get back to. Because for most people, that's not true. I also think for me, restorative justice was a bit more complicated and a bit different um, from how it might be for the average person who would more likely be in there for something like shoplifting. But in those cases, even to help people understand that, you know, they're not evil, they're just, you know, maybe need to do some thinking and reflecting. How does the community come together and heal after a work like this um, was put forward as the emblem of Vermont history and representative of the community? And other people uh, have called out that representation and its whitewashing or nostalgic view of history. How do we reconcile these groups of people? I don't, I don't know the answer. Public art in general, and the mural specifically too, um, is an invitation. It's an invitation for dialogue oftentimes. The artist is one person who might start the conversation, um, but I feel like public art is a gift to the community in that it's inviting dialogue and deeper understanding of different perspectives. You want to heal the city. I don't think the city is really wounded. I mean, I don't think the city feels wounded by the city's reaction. 
or by the reaction of the people who are against us. I believe most people look at them as like outliers. They're a very small minority of people who are unhappy with this. So how does a community heal after acts of violence? Behavioral expert Dr. Neil Marinello weighs in. The key to healing is uh, everybody understanding that uh, what these people did, Albert and Eric, was in fact a crime and defacing a work of art, uh, and that that's not right. Uh, uh, the idea that they were doing it for some higher purpose uh, only holds up if the belief is that there's no other way to get that job done. I believe there were several other ways to get the job done. And what we're dealing with here is what I call polarization. Uh, using one social construct to uh, fight another social construct. A social construct is something which exists as a controlling force uh, in society at a particular moment in time. The way in which this particular work of art was created had uh, a, a business-like approach to it. Uh, it was something of an advertisement, so there's some reality to that. The fact that bringing it to attention uh, of people uh, could be done in a way that didn't polarize them, that didn't say, hey, I'm good, you're bad. Uh, the fact that you didn't think of this shows what a bad person you are and what a good person I am. Uh, all that does is create a good guy, bad guy, uh, Western, Western you know, movie type approach to it. That approach tends not to result in people empathizing with each other. I think there's a rise of call-out culture. It's a complex moment because we're grappling with a long history of oppression and it's so complicated. I would love to see some art <laughs> up here. Real art to me feels, you know, moving and spiritual and powerful. I would love to see something that inspired people, you know, to think outside the box and, and change. I don't think people have a deep engagement. I think art is something which uh, exists uh, as a projective opportunity. In other words, the artist has his perception of what he's doing. The primary responsibility the viewer has is to understand that what it means to him or her is coming from their own experience and from their own perceptions, uh, and that uh, it may or may not be what the artist intended. We put on to any particular experience our own experiences and we project it like a projector projects a movie. The actual source of the movie uh, is far away from the picture that we see. We definitely need to be changing and adapting. And I think a big part of that is, you know, understanding that these issues are structural and a lot, a lot of times subconscious. But if you're perpetuating um, white supremacy, then, you know, we do need to make a change. It's wrong to harm anybody. That if anyone is going to be harmed in a process, they should be harmed as little as possible to get the job done. And the job had better be a real one, not a constructed one. The good part of this is that individuals were not physically harmed in this process. A, a work of art was physically harmed. And recognizing that as a criminal act, I think, is important. That's why the restorative justice approach uh, uh, strikes me as being the, the most appropriate one. Doing something that is wrong and understanding that it was wrong to do it and understanding how it hurt somebody else other than you, uh, you know, is the key to stopping inappropriate behavior. What Albert did was consciously planned and intended to, uh, uh, to uh, start a fire. And, uh, and it was actually quite successful. What Eric did was, uh, was to carry it a little further. I think that, uh, that the concept of is it art or is it craft is just another example of projection. What I would love to see is, is art that inspires people to think and feel, you know, in new and different ways. And, and whether that's directly expressing, um, you know, anti-capitalist or anti-colonial or anti-white supremacist, uh, you know, beliefs or not, good art should make you want to grow and feel open and feel inspired. And those are the qualities that lead, you know, to people being able to make changes on other issues and on other ideologies. When you get into belief systems, 
you have to understand that those are social constructs. There's no such thing as something which is completely right. Whether you consider it art or not, you don't have the right to write uh, something on it that defaces it. When we think about the process of healing in a time when we haven't healed our society, we have to get small before we can grow large. And that is person to person, neighbor to neighbor, religious community to religious community, and neighborhood to neighborhood until it spreads. And if those relationships are strengthened and sustained, and, and we continually maintain them, then we feel that we can not only heal, but feel like we're transforming our community. In order to, to solve a problem, you have to understand the gestalt. And gestalt means the, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. I think you need to recognize that, uh, uh, that the artist was given a job to do and did that job uh, as well as he could. I think uh, uh, Albert saw an opportunity here to make his case. At the same time, he seemed to have trouble accepting the fact that a huge amount of energy went into resolving the issue using the uh, approach that, uh, that the selectmen took. Everybody in, uh, on that uh, committee obviously had their own perceptions that they projected onto this thing. But to understand the whole picture, you have to get the gestalt. And the whole the gestalt was we had a, a, a problem that was uh, uh, being spotlighted by a particular person who wasn't about to back off. Uh, the behavior itself was uh, uh, clearly intended to uh, make the front pages. In the community justice process, just overall, people have asked me so much to, you know, to reconsider my thoughts and actions. And the one thing I would hope from this whole situation is that people just might do a little bit of personal growth um, around what it means to be white in Vermont. Change occurs uh, in people's minds. Everybody has inside them uh, every characteristic of the enemy. The way you change things is through nonviolent uh, action uh, that draws attention to exactly what you want the attention drawn to. The crisis, and there are always crises in the world, especially now, it seems to me, is a crisis in consciousness. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. The good thing about Gandhi and Martin Luther King was that uh, their focus was nonviolent. And uh, by not being violent, uh, you uh, draw attention to the issue. Uh, whether you call it art or craft, winds up directing people's attention to uh, the uh, questionably criminal act that the person uh, engages in. Well, I think the healing process that will go on within Burlington is not unlike the healing process that took place in South Africa after Nelson Mandela emerged from prison, they set up a commission to have a conversation. The conversation is already happening now between those supporting the mural and those opposed to the mural. So as long as the conversation remains civil, remains widespread, democratic, and transparent, I think the desired result that you're suggesting will actually happen. Restorative justice uh, re in includes what I consider to be the single most important um, uh, factor in resolving problems, and that is uh, empathy. Uh, it requires people to get inside each other's heads, understand how people felt and thought when they did the things that they did. Uh, the selectmen uh, actually did the best they could under the circumstances uh, and they did come up with a compromise and with a solution. Uh, the problem is that compromise by definition means nobody gets what they want 
And uh, Albert didn't like that very much. Albert wanted to go to jail, but Albert needs to understand that uh, he really isn't Nelson Mandela. Restorative practices allow us to come together and better understand what it means to be in community. And I look forward to finding more opportunities to spread restorative practices definitely beyond the Community Justice Center. This doesn't have to stop with the criminal justice system. That's why I like the restorative justice approach. I don't believe that it's possible to uh, get inside the head of someone you consider an enemy and not change yourself. When that happens, it's very difficult to uh, rationalize behaving that way again. There is unity and understanding with uh, restorative justice rather than denial and polarization. It is incumbent upon us as the Community Justice Center and as a community to find various venues and platforms as a way of having that conversation. What is, what are appropriate ways to express civil disobedience, to express um, disagreement with a current system or an opinion that's been made that also doesn't infringe on others' rights or, or um, create harm. So one possible positive outcome of this controversy is that it's brought people together to have these conversations about community inclusion and art's role in that. And perhaps that provides an offer or a possibility for a way to move forward from this using the principles that we've learned during this to create a work of art that draws on the strengths of the community to represent how they wish to see themselves and having that impetus of a new kind of community. I do worry about the, the, the kind of the tone of, of our political discourse right now. We're having a hard time talking across, across the divides. And uh, I think people need to take a deep breath need to kind of release their anger and try to really engage with each other. The fact that we can't, it's hard to have these conversations, you know, when there are two really strongly held views, it just says that we've lost some of our skills at civic discourse. Uh, at the local level, we kind of work together as a community. There's a lot we can, we can get accomplished. So what should happen next to the mural? For up to me, I guess. I would hire the same guy to do the job and to put some uh, uh, some more historically appropriate uh, images in it, uh, and, uh, uh, and I'd pay him well, because I think he did the best job he could at the time, given the, uh, the orders he was given. Uh, on the other hand, um, if the mural by itself becomes the issue, if that becomes the spotlight and everybody focuses on that, then, you know, uh, something else needs to be done. And uh, I would recommend getting together uh, the, the pros and the cons, the people on each side, and, uh, and actually forcing each one to take the other's position. In terms of what should happen next to the mural, I think we should follow the council resolution, which, which asked the Burlington City Arts to explore whether there are other appropriate locations, public spaces, for the Everyone Loves a Parade mural. So we need to do that work uh, and then proceed accordingly. I think that this is a moment for us to learn about that, just as I learned about it. Uh, I personally don't think it should be destroyed. I think it should be preserved in some way to tell that story. I think we should add another mural that depicts the complete inclusion of everybody and helps us to elevate the message of inclusivity and mutuality in our society. I think eventually it would come down, but I don't. I think a couple of years from now is too soon uh, for the amount of money that was spent and for the amount of people who seem to enjoy it. Why not get as much as you can from it until it's de dilapidated and showing signs of age and wear? I would leave it up until then. And then, like I say, good luck trying to raise money to put another one up because of all the controversy over this. So. Well, I think what should happen to the mural was a suggestion made by uh, Gina Carrera, whose mural exists underneath this. And this was placed on top of her original mural without her permission. She spoke before the mayor's mural task force, and she suggested that this mural 
be dismantled and then it be put in Ron Redmond's garage. So I would be happy with that. But realistically, there's probably plenty of space owned by the city in which they would be able to remove these pallets. And that's all they are, are pallets that are sitting on Gina's original mural. Take them down and store them. We don't want this art destroyed. We just simply want it removed from the public square. But I think that we, we could find a place that would still, I'm thinking that maybe somewhere at the airport. It needs, it's a big thing, right? So you need a big space. Um, and I think that we, we could, there could be, a, you know, an appropriate new location and then, you know, put another mural up there. I mean, you know, it's not like any mural needs to stay there forever, right? The community evolves and it served its purpose and now let's, you know, we can try again. Maybe they should, uh, Burlington City Arts should auction off the panels so people can use them themselves and they could raise money for other or art projects. I don't think there's another place for work of art that size. But maybe you take a panel here and a panel there. If you actually want to do a mural, please just contact Bruce Wilson, you know what I'm saying? Just come see me, call me up, email me, and I promise you we'll put you on a wall immediately and get you to paint. Yeah, I guess I've been pretty clear that I view it more as a craft and a cartoon and, and an advertisement um, than, than as a piece of fine art. So, you know, I don't, I think it would be fine if it were destroyed, to be honest. I don't think it needs to be preserved. And I think that whole conversation treats it at, you know, as fine art, when in my opinion, it's not. Whatever happens next to the mural, opportunities for deep dialogue around these issues may be lost in recrimination and blame for years to come. Instead, the higher consciousness is for art to bring us together to explore opposing views safely and authentically and to help citizens distinguish between reacting subjectively or violently to art. While this passionately exploring and using the issues a work of art may raise to collectively solve them. Well, right now I'm I'm uh, enjoying my evenings at home with my husband uh, and my job here at UVM. Uh, and I keep my eye, I'm very still engaged in following what the council's doing, still very much care about the city of Burlington. I'm trying to get good people to step up and get involved in city government. There's very possibly another a, a run for, for office in store for me. I would think about running for mayor um, and believe that my experience, you know, really positions me to, to do well. I would ask that people of Burlington consider doing something extra legal as it relates to this mural because people, we've had over two years of dialogue. The dialogue is over. If they want to continue to impose this racist artwork on us, then it's the people's responsibility to, how should I say, popularly revise the nature of this mural on their own in a way that Eric Meyer did. It's incumbent on society to use civil disobedience in ways that respect life and property, but bring about the changes to policy that are impactful in changing the social constructs they wish to change. Just focused on my uh, my art, and my music, and my own personal growth. Part of all of this process for me is just growing around the concept that not everyone's going to like you. If everyone likes you, you're really not doing, you know, doing anything real. But also not, you know, not worrying too much about any one person's opinion because you know everyone has one. <laughs>
happen next with the mural is to find a way to uh, try to work with people to keep it up. I think we need to move on and have another mural here that's painted by some people from the BCA. Uh, what should happen is a growth of murals in the city, all up and down this alley. This mural is doing its job. I mean, there's a lot of controversies in this world right now, and I, I don't know, I just, I wouldn't, like, use my energy, I mean, on something like this or fighting about something like this. Add some color, I guess. Add some, or some people of color, I, I, what I mean. Um, if that's really important to people, sure. The mural should stay the way it is. Leave it alone, okay? Black people is not racism. This is art. <laughs> this is art. It's a work of art. Get over yourselves. And, and actually, it's the right representation of Vermont. I think we just need to continue to educate ourselves and to rely on other people. Um, just use your resources. Um, just spread love and positivity.